Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we left out, all the stuff we got wrong, and all the 1690s we 19 uh, I'm Rob Rath. I'm the head writer of Extra History, and this is our Conquest of India Lies. I'm head writer, but I didn't write this one. Really enormous thanks to Bob Whitaker, who took the writing duties on this series while I went away for paternity leave. Uh, Bob also did our Cleopatra series. He's a professional historian, uh, and he studies the British Empire. So he's very well versed in this topic, and he actually has taught it before. So thanks to Bob, you did a spectacular job. And uh, if you want to follow uh, some st other stuff Bob has done, he has done a he has a great podcast called History Respond, where he talks about history and games with another uh, another history professor that he knows. Uh, it's a fantastic podcast. I really highly recommend it, and he does some really great interviews and commentary there. Lies is made possible by our patrons uh, on Patreon. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I really think Lies is an important part of the show, particularly for a series like this, where the topic is so huge, we couldn't possibly cover everything within our roughly 50-minute window and little 7- uh, and 10-minute episodes. Uh, this is very, very, very crucial. Um, so thank you. If you would like to join our Patreon, you can get episodes early. You can vote on, uh, suggest topics and vote on topics. And uh, quarterly, you can do a Q&A with, with me and Matt and our, some of our artists. Uh, recommended reading for this, uh, this week is A History of Modern India, 1480 to 1950, edited by Claude Markovitz. India, A History by John Key. India Under Colonial Rule, 1700 to 1885 by Douglas M. Piers. Dominance Without Hegemony, History and Power in Colonial India by Ranjit Guha, The Mughals Harban by uh, Harban Mukia. In, we are part of the Nebula network uh, that involves Curiosity Stream. If you would like to join Nebula, we have an exclusive episode on it, and that episode is our Tipu Sultan episode. So if you're wondering, why didn't you mention Tipu Sultan? Because we did a whole one-off on him, um, and specifically the the question of like his legacy and being seen simultaneously depending on who you ask as a hero and a villain. Uh, it's, it's a good episode. I, I like it a lot. Um, but that's why, that's why we didn't do Tapu Sultan because we'd already done one on him uh, and it's over there on Nebula. Uh, just one general thing, Army the Armchair. We got some really good feedback on Army. Um, some people really liked him and thought it was a, uh, a good way to kind of state an argument uh, that, is, that is very common, the kind of the guns, germs, and steel argument, or I would argue a, a sort of popular narrative of guns, germs, and steel that has not necessarily like a full understanding of the book, but um, is uh, taking sort of the principles of, of the book and, and putting it somewhere it doesn't always necessarily belong. Um, there's no plan to make him a regular thing, so uh, if you didn't like him, um, don't worry. Let's jump into episode one. YouTube questions. I, this might be a little shorter because I did not write the episode again, but I have talked to Bob uh, on, on these questions. So uh, it seems there was some dispute as to where the Mughals actually ruled and controlled India, with Tamil, Nadu Kerala, and Assam being disputed as independent during the Mughal period. Uh, what Bob says, the Mughals controlled most of India um, from the 16th century to the 18th century, and it continued to exist as de facto ruler to 1857. So you know, it's not, it's absolutely the case that there were other powers and kingdoms, and but these often paid tribute at one time or another to the Mughals, and the Mughals controlled the most valuable territory, the coast, and particularly Bengal. And the best way to understand the Mughals' position of power is to consider how the British and other Europeans saw them, that they were the ba their basis for contact with the region, uh, they were the power Europeans tried to emulate uh, when they took over, and uh, they were tried to that's the, who the British tried to prop up and borrow ideas from, and uh, who the Indians were trying to revive during the Rebellion of 1857. Um, they were the power behind the Orientalism in the British Raj, and as seen through the Orientalism of the British Raj, as seen through the Durbar we talked about in, uh, in episode one. So uh, there are definitely subsidiary kingdoms. There are other powers. There are there are groups and rulers that are working against that. Um, but the prevailing kind of tide of this narrative uh, to get from point A in episode one to point B in the, uh, or point Z maybe I should say, uh, in episode five was to follow the Mughals. That's not to say the other groups are not important. It's just that 
we have a short format series and we can't cover everything. We were very open in episode one that we were not going to be able to tell the whole story. And the whole story is huge. But, uh, you know, we, we did the best we can to create a narrative through line. Um, but, yes, we, we are very conscious that we had to cut out a lot of things. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the things we cut out. Some people said we should have included Scotland in our uh, 1903 map of the UK. Yes, absolutely. The areas of that map were duped over from another one that was talking about the English Empire uh, early, early in like the, the 16th century. So that's why um, it didn't include that. Episode 2, uh, Hercules always asks some really good patron questions. Uh, in Episode 2, you open up with the Siege of Bombay in 1619. However, the anglo mughal War wouldn't happen until 1686. Could you explain more on this? Yeah, I can explain. It was a mistake. Like, so what happened there is sometimes what will happen is uh, uh, the artist, when they're doing the art, will mishear uh, what Matt, our narrator, says. Something very easy to like 1690 to 1619. And in general, we catch this in episode art uh, during our review process. But during the review process for that one, uh, I, I did the review, so it's my fault. But I was running up and down to the hospital. That was the week my son was born. So that's why. Uh, it just was was missed. Sorry. My fault. Uh, questions from YouTube. Well, this is a comment we thought was very funny. A Mughal sultan sends African Indian soldiers to fight an English merchant company, which in turn sends Japanese ronin to fight a Dutch merchant company, which sends pirates to fight Portuguese merchants in India. The age of exploration is wild. And then someone else commented, it's like historical fan fiction. Yeah, the 17th century is ripe for <laughs> some more treatment by our show, I think. That's what, is one of the reasons I particularly love our, um, our uh, End of the Samurai series, because you get some of that kind of weird historical crosswinds where it's like, they're a samurai with U.S. Civil War equipment. You know, like... Um, someone mentioned that the Act of Union after the failure of the Darien scheme, uh, from, this is Scotland joining the U.K., uh, was proposed by a Scottish dynasty, and the Scottish and English parliaments were merged. So we said Scotland was, conque was uh, conquered, it says it's not really the right word. Uh, and Bob says, yeah, conquest isn't exactly what happened, but uh, they essentially capitulated on, on being an independent state. Uh, you could almost argue that it was a surrender, and this is an issue that will be fought over militarily uh, in the 18th century. Um, but it, And that's when it became a legit conquest, but legally their independence kind of died at that point. One eagle-eyed viewer said that the map at 215 showed a gap between Africa and the Middle East, but the Suez Canal hadn't been built yet. Uh, I love that people are looking that closely and noticing small things like that. Uh, both of us kind of thought it was an effect of the art style rather than uh, necessarily an attempt to depict the Suez Canal, but it's also possible that the, the uh, artist used a modern map when getting the shape of the continents. Um, not really a big thing, but I love that someone looked that closely. That's really neat. Episode three, uh, patron question from Hercules. In episode three, you seem to have neglected the Martha Confederacy entirely, and they were one of the reasons why the Mughals declined. Also in episode three, when speaking of Bengal, you neglected to mention the fact that the region was beginning to be industrialized with the textile industry, which the British would put a stop to after they took over. Could you talk about both things? Episode three is the one where we had to cut out the most material. Unfortunately, again, it's just a consequence of our series being short format, both in episode length and in overall series length. Um, if we did, we probably would have had to do like 12 episodes on this series to include all of that stuff and the uh, Sikh Empire and, um, and, and uh, the Martha Confederacy and that, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, there was a lot taken out of this episode three. Um, yeah, we skipped over the Sikhs, which had to be done for time, but is unfortunate because um, it's a very interesting, very interesting story. And that's why we were so open at the beginning of like, we're going to just have, we're not going to be able to tell this whole story in this format. As for Bengal, yes, one of the reasons Bengal was so valuable is because it was beginning to become industrialized is the wrong word, but developed uh, in the textile industry. And the EIC turned the region into a commercial district and cultivation center to feed industry in England. It's an interesting what if of the 18th century that what if it was just allowed to develop on its own, and would that have changed uh, trade patterns? Uh, some questions from YouTube for this episode. The Mughal Empire was indeed in terminal decline, but EIC was not an empire either. 
Uh, EIC did not even get any direct aid from the British government. If Shah Alam II only ruled Delhi and the surrounding area, then EIC only ruled several coastal factories, not even the city of Calicut or Madras. The war was a simple corporate acquisition done by a bunch of corporate employees, not by a nation state. Uh, Bob pointed out a couple of things with this. One is that the Mughal's decline is really only evident because of the, the, the British victory. Um, and that the EIC did get direct aid from the British government. The British government wasn't sending money, but they were giving them a lot of tax breaks at home, which is its own kind of official support. The way we, we looked at it is that if you control coastal cities, you control the region, which is to a certain extent uh, true, especially when it comes to trade. And uh, the EIC saw itself as a British-English corporate entity. Yeah, they were corporate. They were not necessarily uh, part of the... They were not England, but they were England, right? Hastings and Clive and the rest talked about building their position to England's benefit. So they were constantly apply, applying to the crown and parliament for help. So they're not like England, but they're English, and they're very specifically trying to set up something that's going to benefit uh, the uh, British government. Uh, a lot of people w were disappointed that we didn't talk about Mergefar's treason at the Battle of, Pl Battle of Plassey. To make a long story short on that, basically the British managed to contact a guy called Mergefar, who was a, uh, a uh, paymaster of the Nawab of Mangal's army, and led a large cavalry detachment. We're talking like 15,000 thousand guys, and during the battle he just sort of sat and let, let, the, uh, let the East India Company um, smash up the rest of the army, and he was made Nawab of Bengal afterward, and was actually later rejected. This is the kind of thing, I don't want to talk about it too much, because it's the kind of self-contained story that would be kind of a good thing for a one-off if people were interested in that. Um, every once in a while when we do uh, a larger series like this and we come across something that's a very interesting story um, but we just don't have time for it. We're like, mm, maybe if there's enough interest in it, we do a one-off. We did one for um, the Third Crusade where we talked about uh, the, the scrabbling over the uh, throne of Jerusalem, um, which was a pretty, pretty nutty affair. Um, so just it was just no time to go into this. It was a big backstory that doesn't really change the outcome uh, too much. Um, it's just another another example of, of the East India Company uh, using their influence to, to kind of prop someone up and, and uh, create a collaborator. And it doesn't change the central fact, which is British win and take land rights. Uh, it also gets to a larger point about this history. Bob says that 98% of all accounts on the conquest of India focus on Plassey. Plassey is a battle that's played up a lot in bad histories of India written by the British in the 19th century. Um, that wanted to celebrate Clive as an ancestor in 19th century uh, new imperialism. It's also a battle that does, it's thrown into a lot of these like great battles accounts that were written in the 20th century, these lists of battles that changed history. Um, the Battle of Hattin is another one that, that uh, is mentioned a lot in that, just to go back to our Saladin series again. Um, we decided not to do that here um, and turn Plassey into essentially a footnote because Bob wanted to do something different. He believes the Battle of Bussar was uh, way, way more important because of the result. Also, it was a more close-run thing for the British. And the old version of this being a battle that changed the world plays into old stereotypes of, like, British competence and Indian incompetence um, and gives us kind of that guns, germ, steel idea of European success in Asia, uh, which is not really true. Um, and that it's often held up as the end of the Mughal Empire, but it's not really the end of the Mughal Empire. It continues until 1857. So the old-fashioned way of telling the story of this battle, or the conquest of India, is to stop at Plassey and Clive. And uh, our goal was to show how EIC victory there was just a stepping stone to the eventual full conquest of 1857-1858. Um, Plassey was important for the EIC, but as we see later in the series, the, the company Raj pales in comparison with the British Raj that emerges uh, later. He compares it to Operation Torch in World War II in that it's important, but the battles that come afterward are actually more important uh, and crucial, and they are, they're the ones that really matter. Uh, episode 4. There was a really good comment that, that summed up something that we talked about in Episode 5, but I personally removed because we just there was too much in that episode. We had to pull something, and it ended up being a large section on Orientalism. Essentially, that the company Raj was 
very uh, interested in Indian culture and traditions in uh, the art it was producing. Um, there was there was sort of like a, a, a a certain respect for Indian traditions that was not evident under the British Raj. Um, but it's not necessarily uh, kind of the respect as, as we'd seen it today. It was a little bit of a caricature and, and sort of grabbing things that they felt uh, personally attracted to, uh, which is known as Orientalism. So there's a really great comment on that. In their early days, East India Company allowed the local rituals and customs to be practiced by sepoys. Uh, this, along with a steady high income, was one reason the company was able to employ so many sepoys. However, when the government started to get involved, this started to diminish and the mistreatment of sepoys increased. It's because of British supremacy, where the British government thought their customs, fashion, and tradition were better and elegant, and they thought the British people were superior to their colonial subjects, whereas the company was more interested in profits and didn't mind that they, what the Indians were doing, so long as it was not threatening the, the company's bottom line. Both colonial styles didn't care much for their colonial subjects unless they were useful, but the British government tried to assimilate their colonial subjects into British culture, which the uh, EIC did not. And Bob's uh, comment on this is, yes, the idea of assimilating locals to British culture is definitely something that happens in the early 19th century uh, with more government involvement. That's a big part of the idea of Orientalism as well, restoring an ancient way of life in India, but also building up that perceived idea of Indian culture so that it can be advanced along Western lines, but not too far, uh, because you don't want them to uh, get to a point where they don't need the British anymore. He said, I wish I had a whole other episode to talk about uh, Orient Orientalism and all this stuff. Uh, episode 5. A lot of people pointed out that the cartridges in the 1857 rebellion were not actually greased with pork or beef fat, and they were made in India. This is another thing I removed from episode 5 because it was just, it was, there were too many things in it. Uh, it was way over our word count. Um, some were confused about why this would be offensive. Muslims are forbidden to consume pork, um, and also just culturally it's considered really gross. It's kind of like, think of it like eating rat. Uh, just the idea of, of eating pork is, is sort of viscerally disgusting uh, in, a, in a Muslim cultural context. They're considered really unclean animals. Hindus, on the other hand, don't eat beef, both as a general prohibition uh, against eating meat. Uh, to this day, India has the largest percentage of vegetarians uh, in the world, per capita. Um, and uh, eating meat is considered a, a large-scale act of violence, particularly against large animals. Um, but also it's associated with several Hindu gods who use a bull as a vehicle or can manifest as a cow or uh, uh, cows themselves are sometimes seen as the home of, of gods and spirits. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, religious prohibition <clears throat> on beef consumption. And to this day, you can be uh, criminally prosecuted for killing a cow in, in parts of India. Um, actually, just side note, when I went to India uh, a few years ago, which you should definitely do when travel resumes, it's a wonderful country and uh, you'll have a great time. But one thing you can do if you just want to do some kind of like oddball thing between, you know, seeing the Red Fort and, and going to Rajasthan and stuff like that is go to an Indian McDonald's, which is fascinating because it's the only one in the world that doesn't serve beef. You can go get your Maharaja Mac rather than a Big Mac, which is it's made with chicken. But as we mentioned, the cartridges weren't really, even though this wasn't true, it wasn't really important because it played into this larger narrative that the British were hostile to Indian culture. Uh, and that had already been built up. Uh, for some time. This was just sort of the spark. So the truth or falsehood of it wasn't really that important. Um, and the sepoys, I, I, there was a great line that I was very, very sorry to remove that Bob put in, which was, the sepoys were perfectly happy to use those cartridges on British troops. So that just shows you how much these cartridges were not exactly the, the, the center of this. There's a lot of questioning the time jump we did between episodes four and five. Episode 4 ends with the uh, East India Company Act of 1784. Episode 5 begins with the 1857 mutiny, though in the meat of episode 5 we then go back and uh, fill in. Uh, but this is 100% true. I removed a bunch of the stuff that led up to 1857 because there's just... The final episodes on a series, just in general, are very, very difficult to do because you're often left with a bunch of stuff that you were leaving for later and then you don't get to talk about uh, just because of word count, and they end up getting relegated to lies. So this is my fault, not Bob's fault. Bob had an amazing section on Orientalism that we had to remove. I think it was about 200 words. Um, 
which I was sorry to cut, but something had to go. Um, and it's an important part of the story, but I feel like it's covered in like a read between the lines thing of, of um, the uh, uh, British trying to create uh, British culture in India. Coming up on Extra History, Japanese militarism. We do a little bit of a different thing, kind of if you've seen the seen things on like the rise of Hitler and the Nazis, we're going to try and do that for Japan. So we do a lot more stuff about domestic uh, issues in Japan, not necessarily uh, the colonialism and imperialism. We do mention it, but we put most of our focus on domestic politics in Japan, which I think is a view that you don't always get. So that's why I decided to do it. Uh, after that, Empire Brazil. The way that Bob had a hard time fitting things into the uh, this series on India, I had a hard time fitting things into uh, on Brazil, but it's a really fascinating series. It begins with uh, the, the King of Portugal essentially fleeing Napoleon across the Atlantic and setting up Brazil as his new center of, of uh, the worldwide Portuguese empire. Fascinating topic, but I kept messaging a, a Brazilian friend of mine being like, the history of your country is complicated. <laughs> Uh, it's very fascinating, but it's really complex. Uh, it's a huge area, very diverse, just like India. And then I've just started The History of Beer, which is going to be such a fun series. It's going to be five episodes, four or five episodes, probably five, uh, on uh, the history and development of beer and how it's impacted human culture. If you liked our two-part on uh, coffee, this is... it. If you're asking how do you fill five episodes on beer, we literally start before history. <laughs> You know, we, back in 2016, they found a brewery here in China that is 5,000 years old. So that's how far back it goes. And after that, it's your vote. If you want to vote for topics uh, or suggest topics, uh, you can join our Patreon. As always, keep an eye out. You'll never know when we drop a sponsored episode or some extra episode. We just did that two-part uh, discovery of insulin. And now it's time for Ibn Battuta's side trip. One thing that I found really fascinating about this series is we often talk about this kind of guns, germs, and steel idea of, like, in colonialism, you have Europeans coming to a, uh, a different place and their diseases helping to conquer that place. And this is true in many areas, but it's often reversed in Asia, right, where you have European colonials coming to India and China and Southeast Asia and just dropping like flies, you know, just dying in droves, particularly from malaria, uh, you know, all sorts of all sorts of tropical diseases they're not used to, the particularly malaria. I just wanted to tie this to uh, the history of Hong Kong, you know, because I live here and I think it's a fascinating place. Again, when travel resumes, you might want to come. It's, a, it's, a, it's an enjoyable city, has a lot of cool history. Um, but there's an area called Happy Valley um, and when the British moved in, Happy Valley was it had a lot of rice paddies, and as a result, uh, it had a very high mosquito population and a lot of malaria and mosquito-borne illnesses, and it just be very quickly became famous for the fact that if you got moved to a garrison in Happy Valley, you were just going to die. Like, that's, that's it. Um, so what happened, if you come to Hong Kong today, is... Happy Valley had a different use, which was it became the area where the British and Europeans in general buried their dead. So if you go to this valley, you are completely ringed by cemeteries. There's like the Protestant cemetery and the Catholic cemetery and the Indian and Japanese cemeteries. So they just go up the slopes of these huge tiered burial grounds to like pack in all the colonial dead of Hong Kong, most of whom died from disease. And this was only solved when the British came in and, you know, did uh, drain the racetrack in order, uh, drain, drained the water to create the racetrack, uh, the Happy Valley race course, which is very famous now. So uh, I always thought that was a fascinating story. And elsewhere in the British Empire, you will find these places that were like essentially terraformed because they were not hospitable to Europeans. Um, and it's an interesting thing to look at when you're in a former British colony. It's like, how did they change the landscape that is evident to this day in order to better create an environment that where they felt either comfortable or safe uh, living? And also you look at like, where do people live uh, as far as like rich and poor, like in Hong Kong, it's the peak, right? Because it's cool up on, uh, up on this like large central mountain in Hong Kong. So that's where all the British colonial 
uh, officials lived, uh, carried up there in sedan chairs. God, can you imagine that? Um, so just an interesting thing to look at if you're ever in a, in a British colony. How has this landscape been changed? Thanks a lot. I hope you'll join us for Japanese imperialism. See you later. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.